Hi, everybody. Hi, Joe. Hello, Alexei. Welcome. Um, so you you just raised uh, four hundred and eighty-eight million for Formation Eight, uh, a new fund. You've been called the hottest VC since Andreessen uh, by Fortune. That's a huge compliment. Uh, I'm not sure what type of hottest they were talking about. It was kind of a funny picture when they said that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think he was talking about metaphorically hottest. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you agree? <laughs> well, I think, I think Andreessen definitely has built a really impressive new model that I think Shamath and us and a few others are, are definitely learning a lot from. So in the sense of it's now your job to use the fees to actually hire people and create value and help companies as opposed to just pay yourselves a lot and go golfing. I, th I think there is like a new model that I do really respect that he put in place. And, and I guess we did raise a lot for a, for a fun one, so that's probably why he's saying that. Uh, you raised more than he did in his fund one, so that's really impressive. Yeah, well, it's not necessarily a good thing to raise a lot of money. Hopefully, we can get good returns, too. But it, I think it was the biggest fund one since 1999, which is also not necessarily a good year to compare to. So we'll, we'll see. You're supposed to manage expectations. <laughs> manage them. <laughs> Hottest VC since, I don't know, someone who's second tier VC. Um, so uh, you have a really interesting background. Uh, how did you get here? Well, I, I think I was really lucky to get to work as a kind of a little kid at PayPal. And so I was, uh, I was a Stanford CS and you know, I grew up in the Valley in the Coder. And it was just really cool to get to meet all those people and see all the great companies that came out of there and then work with Peter Thiel. And uh, of course, I, I founded Palantir and worked there for quite a long time. And there's just so many uh, great ideas that, ca that are coming out of there now. So I was inspired to mentor a lot of people and help invest in them. So you were, you were, you stepped down from co-founder of Palantir, you got involved in Lady Gaga startup somehow. Uh, well, Adapar, that makes sense. Adapar is where I spent the most time on the last five years. I, I built a second company after Palantir called Adapar, which is doing great. So what are your, how do you, how are you spending your time? Are you spending it more as a VC in Adapar, like what, what's going on? What are your days like? So I'm the chairman of Adapar, um, but my, my full-time job is as an investor and running Formation 8. And right now we're just really excited by how some of these really big industries are changing and by the opportunities there. So I'm mentoring a lot of entrepreneurs and investing in a lot of companies. Um, tell me about your, your co-founders of Formation 8. Um, so the two co-founders of Formation 8 are, are Brian Koo and Jim Kim. Brian and I have been friends for a, a long time since Stanford. His, his family built a company called LG in Korea. So his father kind of ran LG Electronics for a long time. I've heard of that company. Yeah, and, and it's spun out <laughs> LS. And a lot of what Brian and I have been investing in um, was, were very relevant to the US markets, but also were very relevant to Asian markets. So th these days, if you're gonna solve a hard problem in a big industry like government, finance, healthcare, energy, all of these industries are even bigger in Asia than they are here. So there's a lot of great opportunity to take things to Asia. So um, true, and I'm sure the LG thing doesn't hurt. And it's, it's a nice unfair. <laughs> I, I'm always telling entrepreneurs it's your job to find whatever unfair advantages you can. And so Brian and Jim are definitely unfair advantages as, as co-founders. It's your job to find whatever unfair advantages you have. Yeah. All right, so you've got 488 million at your disposal. Uh, for the benefit of the entrepreneurs in the room, uh, what's Formation 8's investment thesis? Sure, so it's 448. The th 448? Yeah, okay. it's, it's the Lots same. Lots of fours and eights. Yeah. Formation 8 makes it's sense. A, the, well, what we're focused on is people who are trying to solve hard problems that will own, end up owning platforms within big industries. So the main industries we focus on are government, finance, healthcare, energy, education, uh, logistics, and the key thing that we think is happening right now that, that's a new development in the technology world is you have all this infrastructure that was built a few decades ago that runs the big industries. And we think that infrastructure is being upgraded uh, to allow people to bring all this data together to help these industries run better. And we think a lot of the companies that are involved in, in doing this will end up owning very valuable platforms that fix these industries. So you've talked a lot about smart, smart enterprise. I think this is what you're describing. I think there's a slide that should be going up. Can we get the slide? 
There you go. Um, so what's the difference between smart enterprise and just enterprise? So this, is, this is something I put in, that, in, in a little piece we wrote. I think this is vast oversimplification, but I think you've had a lot of these trends over the last 100 years in the technology world where there's a new area that people are focused on that ends up creating a lot of value and changing things. And obviously, especially given we're in New York, I think New York and LA are still very focused on the consumer wave and everything that's happening in the consumer wave. And, and while we still think there are some interesting things there, we think that the most important challenges right now are how you help uh, knowledge workers solve nonlinear problems in big industries. So, so, so the software that was built a few decades ago was about solving linear problems in the enterprise. It was about just basic systems and processes you put in place, make things more efficient. But the thing that's changed the last decade is there's this explosion of information. And in order to process this information and do your job better, you need a lot better technology. So, so upgrading the technology in these industries is what we think is the fun challenge now. So why does all your, how does all your Asia excitement play into this idea of smart enterprise? Well, well I guess if you step back as, like, as an investor or someone looking at the world, there's a couple obvious secular trends that are going to last for the next few decades. And one of those secular trends is how this new, you know, the new economy replacing the old economy, basically, right? So that's, like, that's the one we're talking about with new enterprise, how we're upgrading, causing all this creative destruction in all these big industries. As I think as the president of Goldman Sachs said, we're like the little mammals running around the dinosaur eggs. And so that, that's one big fun part of it. And then the other thing that's obviously happening that's really important is you have the emerging markets you know, developing and catching up over the next few decades. And you have a lot of these places are now even bigger markets than the US. And Asia has, I think, six times as many mobile phones as the US. It's just, it's just obviously a much bigger market. So if you're solving a hard problem and changing a big industry, you probably have even more applications in Asia than you do here. So, I mean, for the longest time, the rest of the world has looked towards uh, the U.S. for innovation and, and market expansion. When do you think U.S.-based founders will start going after the Asian markets first? Well, I think, I think the innovation is still, for the most part, happening here. Obviously, we're trying to work on that with a lot of these immigration efforts and everything and make sure it can happen here. But I think you already see a lot of the founders in Silicon Valley very quickly bring things to Asia or focusing on Asia very early. because. A lot of the most important technologies have winner-take-all effects, and the question is you have to get over there and establish a presence, otherwise someone else is going to do that. What's the biggest misconception about Asia? Well, I think, first of all, I think it's dangerous to call it Asia. So I think that's like one thing. About that's, Korea. Yeah, yeah, well, it's Korea, it's China, China, it's Japan, it's Southeast Asia, it's like Singapore and then Indonesia and India. There's all these really difficult, unique climates in which to operate. and. I think, I think just seeing it as like a monolithic, scary thing is probably pretty normal for everyone here. But it's actually like every one of those markets has their own characteristics, their own advantages, disadvantages. And I think part of the role of good investors is to help teach people how to operate with the insiders in different places there. So the misconception is that it's one big thing. That, 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 that would be one of them. It's also, it's also that it's, it's not necessarily harder to do business there. Sometimes it's easier to do business there. I mean, in Korea, there's like one or two leading ad agencies. And if you get a deal with them, you basically capture the whole market, which is a giant market for certain businesses. Or there's like one big leading media company. So, so, so it's actually easier. You can capture the whole market sometimes, or big parts of the market, if you happen to know the right people and have the right value proposition. So do you consider yourself in the trend of VCs that consider the US or the Silicon Valley not ambitious enough? I know we had Shamath on stage on Monday, and he's definitely part of that trend. Jamal's uh, a good friend. He was very aggressive about, about, about that. I think, you know, he was saying how, you know, 40 years ago, there's people taking sand in apple orchards and, and, and you know, and, and, and changing the world, and other people aren't doing that now. And, and I, I think what's actually happening is it's a lot more democratized, and you can have hundreds of thousands of people who are able to start a company and able to participate. And it, it, it's not going to be the case that everyone is solving the hardest problem in the world and going after the most important thing. I don't know if everyone even has the capability of doing that. So I, 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 don't, I, I wouldn't actually like look down on what a lot of these people are doing. I think, I, it's, I think the question is what you're passionate about. In New York, a lot of people are really passionate about new media. I, I'm not personally as passionate about new media. I'm passionate about fixing all these really hard problems that matter for our society works in the areas, like we said, of energy and of health care and of education. And so I. I personally am more passionate about those harder problems. I, I wouldn't discourage others from pursuing their own passions, though. Um, what do you think Silicon Valley is painfully ignoring in, in favor of something like Snapchat or all these consumer companies? Well, I think, 
I think you see you have all these young people starting companies and they'll start the company in the area that they're most exposed to. And I think a lot of the way our society works is there's these really hard problems that really matter that are slightly esoteric that these kids have never been exposed to. So for example, finance, there's hundreds of really important problems in finance. It's, an, it's a really vital sector for how the world works. And all these kids maybe have seen like payments because they've paid things themselves. Maybe they've never worked with like the multi-trillion dollar mortgage-backed security industry, or maybe they've never worked with, you know, you, you know, credit and defaults and all these other things. So, so there's probably like way too many payments companies. And it's not because that's a bad sector to try to innovate in, it's just because it's the one thing everyone knows. And so it's the same thing with all these problems in energy Is and healthcare. Is that why payments panels are always sort of boring? <laughs> are there just way too many? I, I think so. I mean, I was at PayPal, so it's super critical. But, yeah. but, but, I, but I, I think there's certain problems that everyone knows about, and therefore they all go after. And I think that's why people are so into, into these media companies. And it's, that's fun, it's great, and it's what they care about. I think there's these huge problems, like in how you do energy IT for production, for consumption. There's really hard and interesting problems there. There's tons of areas of healthcare nobody's touched. There's all these areas of logistics that, you know, really important for our society works that I've seen no one going after. Well, you know, there's parts of government that's completely broken that people who are technologists aren't exposed to. So I, I, think, I think like taking a deeper look into these big industries is, is, is for me something I'm more interested in. So if you ask Palantir engineers what they do, they'll say that they save lives. How so? <laughs> no, like exactly how are they saving lives? Well, there's, I think there's a lot of different areas actually that Palantir works in to save lives. The original area, obviously was helping you know, global intelligence and, and defense and stopping people from dying from IEDs in Afghanistan and things like that. But I mean, one of the efforts I'm really passionate about, and you know, I'm, I'm not running Palantir anymore, but I'm still very close to the company as a founder. I'm really passionate about the anti-human trafficking stuff they're doing lately. So I, 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 you know, it turns out there's actually more people who are slaves today around the world than there were at almost any other time in history. This is, this is a horrible thing. And it's really an intelligence problem for how you figure out what's going on there and how you stop it. And so there's been a lot of pro bono work Palantir is doing there that I, I'm really proud of. Uh, a lot of anti-disaster relief things. So I think there's a lot of things Palantir does to save lives. I mean, it's it, using the platform to pinpoint where the drug tra trafficking cartels are and then g giving that data to law enforcement. Is that what the process yeah, is? Yeah, and, and, and working working with the information available to coordinate with law enforcement. It's really it's figuring out incentives as well, because sometimes you have law enforcement that are the bad guys, and, some, and the people report things to them, and they're, they're kind of looped in. So it's how do you figure out everything that's going on and take all the information and, and work with the good guys to disrupt these rings and to, and to save these people. And, and they do something similar for counterterrorism, right? Yeah, so, so, so fundamentally, Palantir is information systems. So we're taking what used to be a very services-oriented market where people would spend billions of dollars on information systems, and we're productizing the space and uh, helping secure civil liberties by tracking how all the information is used and helping them use it better. Um, do you think we'll ever have a cyber 9-11? And how imminent is the threat? Well, I think there's a lot of really smart people at the NSA and otherwise who are constantly working to make sure we don't. Um, I think in Israel as well. The, 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 this, uh, Israel's probably the center of the startup scene for cybersecurity right now. And it's, it is a huge problem. I mean, China is clearly sponsoring tens of thousands of young people to hack into things we're doing here in America. It's part of their, one part of their army's policy. And it's very scary. And, it, and it's, it's, it's clear there's this like cyber like, battle going on in the background. And it's something that, you know, I, unfortunately, probably people from the NSA aren't as excited to be in TechCrunch and, and talk about it. But, but it is something that's really important that it's really good that we're spending a lot of money to try to, try to make sure there isn't a cyber 9-11. I think TechCrunch coverage might not be the best thing for they're, the they're, pretty, they're pretty private, yeah. Uh, let's talk about immigration. You're a backer of Forward. Uh, that's uh, Zuck's immigration group. Can you explain in two sentences what they're, what they're doing? Well, I, I, think, I, mean, I think Shamath covered it pretty well. I think Zuck and Joe Green and, and a lot of others are really passionate about making sure America stays competitive and that we keep people here who want to be here building things with us. I think that every bright person who comes here ends up creating multiple other jobs around them. And I think if you understand how the economy works in a positive some way, it's really good for all of us to bring more bright people here and to create things here and, and keep America on the cutting edge. And so it's just completely ridiculous how our immigration policy works right now. And, and uh, you know, I, th I think we're going to hopefully be able to fix it. How? How can we continue to be the, the talent magnet for the Well, we, well the we, are, we are still right now the talent magnet and we make it really difficult and really disrespectful to them. 
and there's these people here who are helping us build things, and we force them to force them to go away, force them to go through like Byzantine processes. It's just, it's just absolutely ridiculous, and it's it, you know you know a lot of the reason Washington set it up this way. I was talking to one of the founders of Sun Microsystems. So in the 70s, he you know when he was at Intel, he had to go and ask for them to raise the H1B visa cap, and every year he'd have to go and donate to the politicians and make them raise it a little bit. So it's kind of like the system where they extort you, where every year you have to go give them a little bit more money just to be able to get more people in. They've been doing this for 30, 40 years. So I mean, a lot of people in DC don't want to fix this because they get paid every year for us to go bribe them to like let more people in to help our economy. It's just, it's just a ridiculous, disgusting system. And it's, it's, it's time to fix it because if we don't, then we're not going to stay the center of innovation. Is the solution to pay lobbyists? I, I think the solution is, is above my pay grade, but we have some really smart people working on it. And so I think, I think you should ask Zuck and Joe about how they're doing it. But I think, I think there's some pretty cool ideas they have. I'll, I'll ask them. Yeah. Um, and last question. Uh, for the engineers in the room who, who don't want to be or aren't able to be programmers forever, uh, how difficult was the transition from coding to, to business? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think, I think unfortunately, as you succeed, they push you out of the substance, and they end up having to manage and manage people. But it's actually kind of a fun thing. I think my main job became basically after a while teaching people how to manage, inspiring them how to build teams, and you know, you know, being in the company and managing a lot of people and helping build teams and mentoring them is actually really similar to your role as, as an investor. Because as an investor, what you're doing is you're doing the same thing. I mean, a lot of these guys I worked with before, and now they're building their own company, and we're doing the same thing. We're talking through strategy. We're talking about how to get the great people on their team. Talking about their you know architecture. So it's 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 actually a very similar thing. Being learning to be a manager and learning to be an investor. When was the last time you programmed? <laughs> I actually got something. I was having a disagreement with one of my teams like seven years ago, and I got something out and started to try to code it, and then they, they got worried and, and, did it, and, and ended up agreeing with me. <laughs> no, it's been a while. It's, I really respect people like Max Love Jr. who are still there coding and stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm more of the business guy now these days. Well, um, thank you for coming and talking about your business. Thank um, you very much, Alexei.